It's uh, my pleasure to introduce the uh, next speaker in the SWAB eminent tutorial series, uh, Dr. Mike Perone. Uh, I've known Mike a really long time and I, and I welcome this opportunity finally to be able to say what I really think about it, and he can't do much about it. Uh, let me give you some highlights of uh, Mike's career, just a quick capsule run over because his uh, career has been uh, filled with uh, contributions and accomplishments. But uh, Mike got his PhD some years ago, and after a brief stay at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, he moved to West Virginia University, where he uh, quickly moved to the rank of professor, and uh, now has the, uh, the daunting job of being department chair, as well as a uh, research and, and teaching scholar. Uh, some highlights off his CV, uh, he is, uh, as it says on a tag, the past president of uh, this August Association, uh, he's been the president of the uh, board of directors of the Society for the Experimental Analysis of Behavior. He's uh, a fellow of two divisions of the American Psychological Association. Uh, he was program chair at, of this organization several years ago and instituted uh, some of the practices that have now become standard at this meeting, including the separate poster session with uh, the ability to uh, soothe what ails you while you're there. <laughs> Um, Mike's uh, CV also indicates uh, that he's the, been the recipient of several teaching awards uh, at uh, West Virginia University, and I think we'll probably see why that's so as he tutors us today. In addition, uh, Mike's CV lists many significant publications. He has a, an admirable research record using both human and non-human subjects, if we're allowed to say again, thanks to Roddy Rodiger. Uh, his research, uh, I've always found, is characterized by, by obvious care, rigor, thoroughness, and excellent scholarship, uh, the last being a characteristic which I see in a slight decline across behavioral scientists in general, and behavior analysis not excluded. So when I read Mike's papers or listen to his talks, uh, I invariably learn interesting things, you know, get new perspective on things I thought I already knew, I don't want to put any additional pressure on him, <laughs> but I don't think he will, but I think we'll see that again today. Uh, today, Mike's going to teach us about behavioral variability, its control, description, and analysis. Mike? That was, uh, that was a uh, very nice introduction, and um, uh, it leads me to say two things. Uh, first, uh, uh, this will help give you some perspective on the way I deliver this presentation. Um, I was uh, sitting there listening to the end of Jack uh, Michael's or <laughs> Jack Mars talk, and uh, and I thought, okay, uh, there's five minutes. I'll uh, I'll get everything set up, and then I'll go to the men's room. And of course, by the time everything, part of getting everything set up was wiring me up to all these devices. And uh, so I couldn't go to the men's room. <laughs> um, and that just adds something special to this experience. <laughs> yeah. The other, uh, the other uh, thing is uh, that I'm uh, that I wanted to mention is this uh, circumstance reminds me of the case in which the distinguished uh, elderly professor marched into his lecture hall. And, you know, arranged his materials at the podium, and then he did, as he always did, but then at, he did something special. He, he ceremoniously removed his uh, hearing aid, uh, wrapped the cord around it, and put it in the shelf underneath the podium, and he said uh, to his class, I'm, I, I hope you don't mind, but it's, it's going to be terribly dull today. <laughs> uh -huh. So... I've apologized in advance. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, behavioral variability and uh, some of the things that we do with it. Um, and I want to start with uh, a review of some of the ways in which we use the term control. Um, it's used uh, very often uh, to refer to the elimination of extraneous factors, that is, factors that uh, besides the ones that we're specifically interested in. But in point of fact, uh, I think it's very rare that we ever eliminate extraneous factors. 
So what we sometimes try to do is use statistical methods to filter out the effects of extraneous factors. Um, it's a tip-off uh, uh, when someone's doing this when they say, I controlled for something. I mean, if you didn't control it, what did you do? Well, I controlled for it. And uh, a good example is analysis of covariance. That's the kind of classic statistical technique or other kinds of uh, uh, regression-related techniques. You know, I, I, uh, I realized that my experiment had age as a, co -found, as a confounding factor, but I, I took care of it by adding it as a covariate in my analysis. Well, that's, I suppose that's better than uh, failing to recognize the confound, but it doesn't really control it. The other one that's um, uh, uh, more interesting, I think, is, uh, is the practice of counterbalancing. Uh, you know, I, I have uh, uh, two conditions, A and B, so I take half the subjects and I go A and then B, and half of them I go B and then A, and I average across the A conditions and the B conditions, and I say that I've controlled for sequence effects, but of course you haven't controlled for anything. Uh, uh, if there are sequence effects, you've merely done a good job of obscuring them. You, and uh, uh, it's, not that, it's not that having the two different sequences wouldn't be a good idea, it's just that um, you want to know what the effects of the two sequences are. That is, we want to know what variability has been induced by these, the sequence. We don't want to hide it. Um, a, a third way in which the term control is used is in it holding extraneous factors constant. And uh, now we're moving into more of the realm of experimental kinds of control. So someone might say, you know, I controlled uh, the inter-reinforcement intervals in, com say, in comparing a, a variable, in, uh, variable interval and variable ratio schedules. I, I controlled them using a yoked control design. Well, the, you know, now we're we're playing my kind of music. Um, of course, uh, uh, the term control is often used uh, to refer to a basis of comparison in a, in a group design. That could be a control group. But in, in a single subject design, people sometimes say the subject serves as its own control, which is just to say that there's some baseline or reference condition that serves as the basis for making inferences about the effects of experimental manipulations. And then uh, we get to the uh, meat of the matter, which is uh, controlling the independent variable of your study, that is manipulating a, I put this word in for uh, Mark Branch's benefit, uh, uh, manipulating a putative causal factor. I, I've learned that people at the University of Florida are very careful about their language, and uh, they like to use the word putative. Um, so this leads to some issues in experimental design, and I, I really don't have very much to say about experimental design, and I never have, because I've always thought that experimental design is a, um, a, a fairly straightforward matter. Uh, it involves uh, trying to make a persuasive case regarding the inferences you draw from your data about causal relations. And examples of good research designs are just the ones that tend to be successful, the ones that tend to allow you to persuade uh, a, an audience of critics that the inferences you draw are reasonable ones. Um, I've never understood how anyone can write a textbook, and, and I've, I've, I have several on my shelf uh, back home, write a textbook where there's essentially a, a chapter called the AB design, and then there's a chapter called the ABA design, and the, then there's the, a chapter on the ABAB design. I expect it to work up to the abracadabra design, which is say, uh, hey kids, it, it works like magic. Um, because really, uh, uh, the objective of design is so, is so straightforward. Um, I, I, when I teach a, my uh, research methods course, I, I run out of uh, things to say in the lecture on, on research design uh, because I, I do see it as such a simple thing. Um, and I'm put in kind of the same position as uh, William Strunk, of, uh, the author who uh, wrote uh, The Elements of Style with E.B. White. He, 
he, you know, one of the rules was omit needless words, and uh, he was so good at it that uh, when he gave his lectures, he tended to repeat himself. So he's said to have stood at the podium and say, omit needless words, omit needless words. Well, um, experimental designs, I, I, don't, I don't see what, what the big deal is, except that what you have to do in your experimental design is to address threats to internal validity. Um, I won't say anything about external validity because uh, I don't think that I have anything new to say about it. Um, uh, I don't think that behavior analysts are at any um, uh, disadvantage uh, relative to other uh, methodological approaches when it comes to external validity. Um, but we do have a problem in communicating the power of single subject approaches to psychology. We have trouble conveying the power of those approaches to our colleagues who favor group statistical methods because we don't talk their language. And one of the, one of the things that we rarely talk about are threats to internal validity. Even though uh, conventional textbooks on research methodology and experimental design are organized around uh, these threats. Um, the ones that come up the most in, in repeated measures designs, of which a single subject design would be an example, are uh, the ones that uh, Campbell and Stanley labeled history, maturation, testing, and instrumentation. And, and these refer to such things as um, experience with schedules of reinforcement, uh, biological processes uh, correlated with the passage of time, uh, repeated exposures to the testing environment and uh, uh, the potential, this is a fairly rare one, but potential drifts in, uh, in the uh, calibration of measuring devices. Um, we probably don't worry too much about that because so much of our measurement is done by computers, but we still need to worry about some of the other things we use, like electric light bulbs and, and things of that nature. They, they can, they, their characteristics, physical characteristics, do change as they're used, and um, our subject's behavior may be sensitive to that. So when, you're, when your red key light finally burns out and you replace it with a new bulb, even though it's still an 1820 bulb, um, it's probably going to operate much brighter than the one you replaced, and that may introduce uh, some unwanted variability. Um, here's an example of uh, some steady state data from a paper by Reed and Wright, and uh, isn't it great? And, and they, um, the, the numbers across the top refer to the number of pellets that were delivered as reinforcers um, to rats. Uh, working on variable ratio schedules. And you can see that across the first four conditions, the response rates uh, rose as the reinforcer magnitude was increased. Now, if they had stopped right there, it would have been a defective design because it would have been impossible to say whether the increasing response rates were the result of the manipulated variable, or whether they were the result of experience with the procedure. After all, rats do get uh, uh, much more efficient uh, pressing levers on ratio schedules uh, with the passage of time, with experience, or whether it was due to uh, you know, the, uh, the aging of the animal or something of that nature. But of course, uh, they solved the problem by uh, uh, replicating one of the conditions. And the successful reversal, although not complete, uh, certainly uh, eliminates any claim, uh, uh, any serious uh, rival alternative hypothesis to the, to the one that the experimenters obviously favor, that is the reinforcer magnitude is the operative variable. Notice, though, that, that the response rate in the replication of the one pellet condition matches the response rate in the two pellet condition rather than in the initial one pellet condition, probably reflecting the operation of experience with uh, the lever pressing uh, procedure. So, uh, you know, the, the design does not eliminate a maturational process or a repeated testing process. It simply allows you to dissociate the effects of that kind of process from the one that you're interested in. 
Um, you know, that kind of design, I'll go back for a second, that kind of design is a pretty simple design, although I don't know what, what you'd call it. Uh, I, you know, I guess you couldn't put it in your book because it would have to be called an A, B, C, D, A design, and you can't have a design like that. So, but you can, but if you, if you disregard the alphabet soup of research design, it makes perfect sense and it makes an, a, a compelling case. Um, but look, here's a design uh, this, uh, that, that's a three wave factorial design. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, data that were, uh, these are data that were collected by um, uh, Chad Galushka and Tammy Wade Galushka. And um, uh, this is the behavior of a single pigeon uh, uh, working on fixed ratio schedules. It was a multiple schedule and sometimes the reinforcer was a large amount of grain, and so, or a lean, excuse me, it was a lean schedule, it is, they got a, a little bit of, of grain, and sometimes it was a rich schedule, they got a lot of grain. And um, the data are analyzed in relation to the past schedule and the upcoming schedule, that's what you see within any, any panel. And then across conditions, what was manipulated was the, uh, the bird's deprivation level, 70, 80, or 90 percent uh, of their free feeding weight. And you can see that uh, if you look at, say, the third panel, the 90 uh, uh, percent weight panel, that um, the pauses in the transitions between the rich and lean schedules uh, are generally very short, except in the critical transition uh, after a rich schedule and in the presence of a stimulus signaling that the next schedule will be lean. And in that rich to lean shift, you have uh, extended pausing. The data point there is the median, and that rather large error bar shows the interquartile range. That is, the, it extends from the 25th to 75th percentile. So what you see within that panel, I guess, would be what would typically be called a uh, two-way interaction between the past and upcoming conditions of reinforcement. But notice that the size of that interaction, uh, the intensity of that interaction is moderated by the level of food deprivation. If the animal is suitably motivated at 70 percent, the interaction is, is dramatically reduced. Um, and uh, again, uh, this isn't a sequencing effect because the replication of the 70 percent condition uh, reverses the the uh, change in the data. This is uh, what uh, our colleagues, uh, many of our colleagues, would refer to, a, uh, to as a three-way factorial interaction, um, all in one animal. Uh, not bad. Uh, you know, for some reason, uh, behavior analysts don't like to use the word factorial design. I don't know why, because it clearly applies in a case like this, and in many others that you can find in the pages of JAB. Um, it has no necessary connection with the analysis of variance. Um, not that there's anything wrong with the analysis of variance, but um, okay, so there's the factorial design. Um, now, of course, uh, these kinds of design considerations are all embedded in what we refer to as the steady state strategy, which involves uh, stabilizing behavior within each experimental condition. But as I've already noted uh, uh, by the two examples I've given, that in and of itself does not substitute for appropriate uh, design strategies that address threats to internal validity. Um, we tend to use operational definitions of stability to decide when a condition should be ended. And then we use the terminal sessions to represent the steady state. Now. Um, Sidman, in his classic book, recognized uh, the use of visual stability criteria as well as fixed time criteria, and I think you'll see both of those represented among uh, the kind of research that people at Squab do. Um, but more typically, we like to use uh, mathematical uh, criteria, and these can be either relative or absolute. Um, and I would like to give you some examples uh, very briefly and show you some, some uh, important considerations. Uh, an absolute criterion would, would, would work something like this. Uh, during the last 10 sessions, the mean response rate during the first five and last five sessions has to fit within some absolute value, like five responses a minute. Now, uh, what this would mean is that if the prevailing response rates were about 50, 
that would be equivalent to a 10% relative criterion. If the, if the response rates were 100, it would be the equivalent of a 5% criterion. Um, in other words, the, the relative variation in behavior that's tolerated by an absolute stability criterion will depend on the prevailing response rate. Um, this function shows what the relative variation, uh, uh, what relative variation would be allowed by an absolute criterion of one response per minute at a range of prevailing response rates. Um, this is what it would look like at two responses a minute. Um, this this, draw, this uh, reference line drawn at, at 5% um, shows that if you have a, uh, uh, a prevailing response rate of, of 20 responses a minute um, and you have a one response per minute absolute criterion, that's the equivalent of a 5% relative criterion. Um, if, you, if you have a, uh, uh, a two response per minute criterion, then you could go up to uh, 40 responses per minute um, and still be within the 5% criterion. Now, the, the relative criterion then is you say, well, the difference between the two sub-blocks of sessions has to be no more than some percentage. And um, uh, this, this uh, graph shows the amount of absolute variation that's tolerated uh, by different kinds of uh, relative criteria uh, as a function of the prevailing response rate. So, um, you know, a 10% criterion, the black function there, uh, a 10% criterion uh, would allow uh, a variation of five responses per minute if the prevailing response rate is 50, but it will only allow uh, a variation of uh, one response per minute if the prevailing response rate is 10. Um, and we'll just skip over that. So the stringency of the mathematical criteria uh, are related to the prevailing response rate. Uh, absolute criteria become more stringent in relative terms as response rates increase. And relative criteria become more stringent in absolute terms as response rate decreases. And the, the, uh, the practical message from an uh, experimental strategy standpoint is that it's very difficult to adopt a single stability criterion in an experiment that is expected to generate a wide, wide range of rates. Um, usually people will abandon uh, relative criteria when response rates get very low, for example, if they want, if they're trying to extinguish behavior or something of that nature. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to highlight, though, uh, the most important limitation of stability criteria, which is that a criterion does not substitute for a description of the stability that's actually attained. Um, and uh, I, I would like to uh, read a quote from uh, Michael Zeiler's uh, editorial when he was the editor of JAB. Uh, I was a graduate student at the time, and in those days, you know, if the editor of JAB said something, I knew I should learn it and be important. But it was important. But I was only uh, I was only a graduate student during uh, Zeiler's uh, term as editor, and I didn't learn anything from the. Uh, subsequent editors of J.M. Because <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't pay attention anymore. Um, anyway, he said, uh, we all know that grouping of the data of different individuals can yield a measure of central tendency that does not correspond with the behavior of the individuals. What may be less widely recognized is that groupings of data for a single subject can also obscure the characteristic behavior of that individual. Just as the mean for a group composed of widely differing individuals may not be representative of any group member, data averaged or accumulated over one or more sessions may not represent the details of the performance. Particular problems or trends in theory may dictate an interest in behavior integrated over long time periods, thereby making it appropriate to report average response rates, response rates summed over one or more sessions, or some other summary measure. Um, 
He was uh, referring, of course, to those days. In those days, to the uh, ascendancy of work on the on the matching law and and, uh, and related uh, uh, issues. In a particular experiment, such measures may provide a proper level of analysis. Yet the reader is left uncertain about the details of the performances that make up the overall measure. The information provided by a concise summary is inseparable from the question of variability, whether the summary involves the same or different subjects. If performance is not variable within or between subjects, a, a statistic describing central tendency is adequate. But less uniform performance means that central tendency is an insufficient description. In short, measures of central tendency in individual subjects, as with groups, must be supplemented by a description of variability or stability. And this became an editorial policy of J. Abs uh, uh, in the late 70s, although I don't know that it's um, honored uh, anymore, although I think it still is in the instructions to authors. Now, to illustrate um, uh, some of the points uh, that are relevant, I've concocted some data. Um, here uh, are two, two sets of uh, five data points, and the means in each case are 100. And you can see the standard deviations there. There's a little bit of variability. Um, notice that since the means of both of my subgroups uh, are identical, that uh, I would meet the most stringent absolute or relative criterion because there's no variation in the two means. It is uh, all the means here are 100. Uh, but I could have had uh, substantial variability. And see, this, this uh, set of data meets the same 0% stability criterion, but so just knowing the stability criterion doesn't really tell you very much about the the uh, session to session variability. It's easy to overlook that. Um, here it's even more variable. Or how about how about something like this, where um, the variability actually changes even though the, the, the uh, measure central tendency doesn't change. These are the sorts of things that that, uh, that Zeiler was worried about. Now, how, how is one to, then to describe terminal data? Well, obviously, uh, uh, you're going to have measures of central tendency. And sometimes in, in the, the pages of JAB and in other single subject design kinds of uh, studies, that's all you get. And I, um, I sometimes have tried to justify this to uh, uh, students by saying that the, uh, if the data have met a stability criterion, then uh, maybe it's enough that just measures of central tendency are reported. But obviously, I was wrong when I said that, because as the examples uh, that I just showed you illustrate, uh, you can meet uh, incredibly stringent uh, stability criteria and have a wide range of variability in your, in your terminal data set. So this really isn't very satisfactory. So instead, you need some measure of variability to go with uh, the measure of central tendency. Or session by session graphs, which allow the reader to see the variability and do what they will with it. Uh, with regard to session by session graphs, uh, as I say, it lets the reader uh, evaluate the level of stability actually attained. But it can be difficult to see functional relations in parametric studies, such as dose-effect dose curves or studies of the uh, uh, you know, discounting functions, things of that nature. Uh, and only a limited amount of data can be presented. Uh, here's, here's an example um, of, a, of an ABA design from a very simple experiment. We don't need to worry about what the uh, experiment was about. But uh, I hope you will agree that uh, uh, there was a clear and reversible effect of whatever it was that was manipulated. The other thing, though, that you might want to notice is that the response rates themselves are very low on the order of uh, two responses a minute. And so um, no reasonable relative stability criterion could have ever been met by this study. And uh, the, the uh, uh, experimenter luckily had the good judgment to uh, use a visual criterion, and then, and then had the good fortune to uh, have manipulated a variable that was potent enough to make the effects clear. Um, 
Well, if you're going to use a statistical summary of variability, what should you do? Uh, well, the obvious example would be the uh, standard deviation, but sometimes you'll see people use the standard error, and um, I often find myself in the position of trying to explain to students when they should use one or the other, and I, I will advance my reasoning to this audience with trepidation, uh, because I think you'll probably disagree with me, um, and that's, uh, that's okay. Um, I remember as a, uh, uh, Tony Nevin, uh, when he was editor of JAB, used to show himself at ABBA and have these uh, sessions where you could talk to the editor of, of JAB. And, uh, I, and one of these things, I raised my hand and I said, uh, Dr. Nevin, uh, sometimes uh, people uh, report the standard deviation and sometimes they report the standard error. What do you think of that? And he, uh, he said, viva la difference. <laughs> and I've, I made it my, my uh, purpose in life to uh, stamp out the difference. You know, my argument is that, that it really does make a difference which one you use uh, for both practical and theoretical reasons. Uh, now, here's a, uh, to illustrate my point, uh, I, I concocted a hypothetical uh, set of data. There's a hundred data points here. They happen to have a mean of a hundred and a standard deviation of a little less than three. Uh, I think if you had data like that from a pigeon, you'd probably say it was stable. In fact, you'd say, why did you run out of the conditions so many sessions? And I'd say, because I work at the University of Auckland. <laughs> uh, and and uh, he'd say, only a hundred sessions? Um, if, if you were to take all possible uh, sam uh, uh, samples of consecutive sessions and apply a 5% stability criterion to it, um, you would find that uh, once you get to a sample size of about 10 sessions, virtually uh, uh, every, every uh, possible sample would meet the 5% criterion. But if you only have four or six sessions, you, you will have a few uh, samples that don't meet the stability criterion. This is just a way of showing that the data set is, stabil is stable by most conventional measures. Now, with regard to the measure of central tendency, if we calculate the mean based on consecutive pairs of sessions, that is, samples of size two, and, and then plot them, so we're plotting a moving window of means based on two sessions, this is what you get. It, it clearly hovers around uh, 100, but it does have a bit of, of uh, bounce. If we just go to five, we smooth things considerably. This is an obvious uh, uh, sampling issue. If we go to 10, boy, it really looks great. Uh, the sample size does make a difference, even, even with means and even with inherently uh, uh, stable data. But what about the standard deviation? Well, um, I'm going to calculate the standard deviation using the N weight, which is what I believe is the appropriate measure when the standard deviation is used as a descriptive statistic. And when you do that with samples of size two, you get lots of noise. Uh, with samples of size five, you s it still looks pretty variable. And uh, with samples of size 10, it starts to, uh, it starts to settle down. Uh, clearly then, the, uh, the, the standard deviation, which is the thing we're worried about the most uh, for present purposes, um, is very sensitive to the sample size. If we use the uh, N minus one weighting, um, the situation is uh, a little, is not too different, but it, it, it makes a difference at small sample sizes. This function shows the, uh, the uh, value, uh, the, the value of the uh, standard deviation uh, with different sample sizes in our hypothetical data set. And the black bars show the uh, calculation with the N weighting and the white bars with the N minus one weighting. And of course, as the sample size gets large, uh, there's a very little difference between the two. But when the sample size is small, I would argue that the N minus one weighting overestimates 
the variability in the data set. Remember, the goal is to describe the variability in the actual numbers that you've got on your piece of paper, not to make an inference about some uh, hypothetical population. Now, the standard error of the mean, what, what is that? Well, th that's what it is. It's, uh, it's basically the uh, standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Um, if you calculate the standard deviation with the n weighting, it's the standard deviation divided by the square root of n minus 1. Clearly, the uh, standard deviation is going to be a lot smaller than the standard error. Or excuse me, the standard error is going to be a lot smaller than the standard deviation. Um, and how much smaller it's going to be is going to depend on your sample size. Uh, this is the same graph I showed you before, but I've added a third function showing the standard error uh, when it's calculated uh, over that same data set with different sample sizes. And it becomes, I don't know, I'm, I'm tempted to say vanishingly small, but it gets real little. And um, if you, uh, if you draw a function uh, where you connect a bunch of means and you accompany it with error bars that extend, uh, let's say, one standard error above and below the mean, it looks a lot better than if you have a standard deviation above and below the mean. And so if, if nothing else, you need to know what it is you're looking at. And of course, everybody in this group does, except for the people that don't, because uh, because you, I, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and you can take uh, uh, doctoral students who uh, uh, practically have a foot out the door of the university and uh, ask them about an article they just read in JAB and, and say, in that figure there, is that the standard error or the standard deviation? And usually they give me a blank look, which means that uh, they, don't, they, they can't figure out what the distinction is. Um, but see, it does make a big difference, and uh, you have to be careful about that. Um, this is uh, not too important. So I wanna, I'll, I'll, I'll close with a few observations and suggestions. First, um, stability criteria do not in themselves describe the variability in a behavioral study state. Report enough information to allow readers to evaluate the degree of stability achieved in your experiment. Conventional indices of variability are often confused, and published reports are often ambiguous. Sometimes, you, uh, even in the pages of JAB, you will find that uh, uh, it is impossible to figure out what the error bars in a figure mean. And it's, it's simply not the case that, ev that you should know what they mean, because sometimes they're interquartile ranges, and sometimes they're standard errors, and sometimes they're standard deviations, and sometimes they're plus or minus a standard deviation, and sometimes the whole ex expanse of the bar is just one standard deviation. And if you're serious about evaluating uh, uncontrolled variability, you need to know what it is that you're seeing. Um, think before you point and click, uh, you, uh, uh, if, you, if you ask five graduate students to calculate the standard deviation of a set of 10 integers, you'll get at least two different answers, even though they're both using Excel. <laughs> I, uh, I will bet you uh, the limit on my credit card, which is substantial. <laughs> Um, I would argue that the standard error is intended to support inferences about the stability of a sample mean. And usually when we report means, the means of uh, uh, single subject experiments, what we really want to know is not the stability of the mean, what we want to know is how representative is that mean of the terminal data. And so the standard e error is not the right number to use. You want to use the standard deviation. And furthermore, you want to use the standard deviation with the n weight. And if you don't buy my argument uh, here on the screen that the n minus 1 weighting is, is really to estimate a population parameter, maybe you can accept the fact that the 
in waiting will give you a smaller standard deviation and make your data look better. Finally, experimental control of variability trumps any form of statistical evaluation of variability, whether it's by analysis of covariance or whether it's by uh, sleight of hand with stability criteria. Thank you.